Welcome to our last lecture for the day, and that's Akan Worlds. So the Ashanti, or an Akan people, are in modern-day Ghana, and they're connected to the Sahara through trade routes. And originally they had resisted conversion to Islam, uh, so we don't see Islam in most of these areas, although there are people to the north who have converted to Islam. And um, there had been an ancient gold trade, and then post-colonialism, that gold trade continued with the West. Eventually, out of this, the Ashanti Confederacy developed in about 1700, and they had conquered neighboring people and had imported artists. So some of the neighboring people that they had conquered um, were not Akan peoples, um, but they were able to import artists from these different cultures and integrate them into their more modern cultures. So royal regalia in Ghana, and we can see the ruler of Ijisu uh, wearing gold and kenti cloth. So the idea according to Visona with this type of royal regalia is ensemble and visual overload govern the aesthetics. There's a certain amount of intentional design redundancy and there's a saying that great men move slowly. So wearing all of this very heavy gold jewelry and this kenti cloth uh, would require a man to move slowly. So that's kind of what that saying refers to. But also kings in Ghana are expected to get as big as possible. So you often see um, rather heavy set kings uh, amongst the Ashanti. So the one idea that's important to understand with the role of kingship amongst uh, peoples in Ghana and the Ashanti is that it's not the same as you would expect um, from kingship in the West, where there is, especially in the 17th century and 18th centuries, there was this idea that the king is a ruler overall, uh, Louis XIV talking about how he's the sun king, almost a godlike figure. And we do see a godlike association with some of these rulers, but the idea is that they rule at the behest of the people. So everything that you see the king wearing here, his regalia, um, the throne that he's sitting on, his kente cloth, is all state-owned property. So the king, while on one hand being thought of as above everyone else, is also accountable to everybody else. Um, so that's a very important way of thinking about kingship that is quite different than what you usually see in Western societies. So the kente cloth is made with strip weaving techniques. And I'm gonna include a link to this video about kente weaving, which it will be underneath um, in the YouTube description. So the richest kente are primarily silk. They have a shimmering twill-like texture and are exclusively royal weaves. Uh, there's more than 300 name patterns. So the way these were made, and you'll be able to see some of the more technical details about how they're made in the video, uh, which I encourage you to watch now before this part. But we have strips and they have certain patterns and some patterns are for certain royal families and nobody, if they can afford one, uh, would be able to use it outside of this royal family. But just like what we saw with the drumming amongst the Mende, the particular arrangement of the patterns in the strips is expected to be improvised. So again, there is no value for doing something as it had done before, that's considered to be crude amongst many West Africans. So this applies to these textiles, it also applies to music as we saw with the Mende, uh, and African drummers in, in Ghana as well. Also uh, value improvisation over doing the same thing over and over again. So we see the same thing with the kente cloth. Uh, amongst the Ashanti, uh, only men are weavers. So when you watch a video, you'll notice that there's only men who are working in the weaving. And when I see this type of texture, and this type of kente cloth is normally worn by the wealthy, but again, it's state, uh, by royalty, but again, it's state property, so they don't have to come up with the funds for it themselves. 
um, wealthy people could certainly commission something like this as long as they use uh, patterns that aren't reserved for the wealthy or for the uh, royalty. But this type of cloak would be very expensive, uh, several thousand dollars to be able to create it. And if you think of, I used to go to Catholic school and wear silk ties that were made in a similar manner. Uh, in the 1980s, those would be $25. So think about that and then times it by about 50 and you can understand why these cloths are so expensive. Hopefully this picture can kind of show you this lustrous type of quill-like quality that these um, kente cloth have. When we talk about contemporary Western art, we'll talk about how some of them were influenced by the kente cloth a little bit later on, specifically with El Anitsui. So moving on to Ashante people, and the thing we're gonna talk about with the Ashante are the Akuaba. So in the 18th century, uh, the Ashanti were a gold trading kingdom. Uh, it became modern day Ghana and imperialism. Um, and they became quite wealthy. So the origin of this particular figure, uh, the Akuaba, comes from a legendary woman named Akua, who was the first woman to use a wooden figure. I'll include a link to a cute little kid made video uh, telling the story of Akua. And there are some problems with the story, like they talk about it being in the deepest jungles of Africa and they show zebras and such, none of which are true for the Ashanti. They don't live in the jungle and there's no zebras around as far as I know. Uh, but it does tell the story pretty well. Uh, Akua was a woman who um, wished to conceive a child and she was having trouble conceiving a child. So she went to see a priest and the priest commissioned a, what you see here, the Akua, the Akuaba. And what this is, is it represents a baby. The priest told Akua to take care of this figure exactly as she would a real child. And Akua thought that was out there. She, didn't, she thought that was kind of wild and didn't think it would work. But she was in dire straits, so she decided to do it. Um, she carried it around in a sling on her back, just like you would with a regular baby. Um, it's made out of wood, so you don't oil a baby, but you oil the wood to take care of it and feed it and all of that sort of thing. Then she conceived the child, and even better, she conceived a female child. So the Ashante are matrilineal, meaning that the family name and status goes through the woman's side. So you want to have a female child first. Um, so that's why when you look at the Akuaba figures, they often have small breasts, uh, and that's the show that this is a feminine figure. So everyone in the village thought at first that Akua was also kind of wild and out there, but once they saw that she was able to conceive a child, this um, particular practice Start, carried on. So you also see some other qualities to the baby. First off, um, cute baby, big old forehead, uh, eyes farther down than the middle of the head, tiny mouth and tiny nose. So a cute kind of baby figure, desirably pudgy so we can see the kind of rolls in the neck. You want your baby to be nice and chubby so that it can be healthy and a glowing shine, which again comes from part of taking care of the figure is to oil it and shine it and make sure that it looks nice. And that's to show that you want a very healthy child. Uh, you can also see how some people attach various regalia and jewelry to the figure. On the left, it shows a woman um, and she's holding her baby in the sling. Uh, and then on the right, you can see the akuaba being held in the same way. So this is also for women who want to protect their baby during pregnancy. So they're already pregnant. Uh, they would carry around the Akuaba and its spiritual power would help to protect um, their future baby. So the high forehead, a sign of cuteness, but also a sign of beauty. Uh, and Ashanti women uh, often pull their hair back to be able to show their forehead. So it's also known as Akuama. So if you look it up, uh, on the internet, you might be able to find other figures like that, also called a kuama. 
So the Shanti, again, are matrilineal. So lineage, property, and political office. So it's very important that you have a feminine child first so that you can carry on your status. And if you're a more powerful person, it's even more important uh, that you carry on your status through the female line. So the statue is a lyrical interpretation of the perfect baby. Its whimsical innocence captures the essence of any mother's dream for a healthy, well-behaved child. So how is this showing well-behaved? A tiny little mouth. So this isn't a baby that's always crying and screaming. Uh, I remember my sister, her first child uh, was very quiet and everyone was talking about how she, lucky she was. So the Akuaba represents that. You want a baby that um, doesn't cry too much and doesn't scream too much. So moving forward to modern times uh, is Kanekwe and his coffins. So this particular one is in the shape of a cocoa pod. Um, and as you can see, nobody was actually buried in this one. This is in the Fine Art Museum of San Francisco. But Quay actually ha has, takes commissions for these, and people are literally buried inside of these coffins. So how the coffins are made is Quay asks them, well, what do you want? How do you want to represent yourself? And oftentimes, people represent themselves from their profession or status. So in the case of this one for the cocoa pod, it was for a farmer. Um, not this particular one, because it's in the museum, but the one that went into the ground with his body in it. And then another example would be a Mercedes Benz for a rich guy, which I'll show you in a moment, a whale for a fisherman, a very popular one. Um, and the idea is that there, this is art, so it's a way for Clay to express themselves, for the people who commission it to express themselves, and also utility. It's literally a coffin that's gonna be going to the ground. So what's the origin of these? Um, there's a lot of different ideas, but one is probably these figurative plankins uh, that were made for people of high status and royalty amongst the Ashanti. So one is pictured here, you can see as a cock. And here's an example of the plankin being used. This one is a bull. Uh, and a plankin, as you can see, uh, is basically a cart, or in this case, it's carried, and a person of high status will be taken through the town or on parade or whatnot. So as um, in the neo-imperialist and post-imperialist era, we see that there's a lot of people get wealthy in other ways, um, so they will use uh, and commission these coffins from Kanekwe. So this is an example that is the Mercedes-Benz, and not just any Mercedes-Benz. You can see it's the long one. Uh, it's the one that's often driven by um, heads of state. And you can also see that it has curtains throughout, so to hide the occupants. Um, so Kanekwe began sculpting coffins in the 1980s. And his fa he's died since then, but his family continues it on. So if you want to commission one from the Quay family, you can totally do that. Uh, and again, this is a different spelling for his name. Same person. Uh, it's just spelled in different ways. It's a foreign word. So one thing um, that these are associated, these coffins with, is also the whole rituals of death. So unlike death in the West, which occurs largely out of sight, at a sanitized remove, Death in West Africa remains a comparatively immediate experience, while funerals remain fixed communal weekend celebrations. Um, so obviously people are sad when people die uh, in West Africa, just like anywhere else, uh, and people are crying and sobbing. But there's also a celebration because you're moving on to another world where you're free from the pain and suffering that you might have had in life or the difficulties or responsibilities that you had in life. Uh, and you can be a spirit that can enjoy the afterworld. So it's both um, a mourning, but a celebration. And most likely, the types of celebrations that you see in African-American communities, uh, especially in places that are weren't originally colonized by the British, like New Orleans, um, the British did a very good job of eliminating uh, these types of, of rituals amongst the slave population which you know, we'll kind of talk about later on why they would do such a thing, same reason why they would do it for imperialism, certainly. Um, but the French allowed certain things to continue, and the types of 
death celebrations that you see and the relationship with death that you see in New Orleans in black communities, and it's also made its way into non-black communities, is probably reflective of these types of ways of looking at death in West Africa. So that's the end.